Hi, welcome back to ESP46 Basic Thermodynamics. This is module 6.5 on the Carnot cycle. The sections in the textbook are 6.7 through 6.11. Here are the three learning outcomes for this module. At the end, you will know the steps of the Carnot cycle, you will understand the two Carnot principles, and you will be able to quantify the Carnot efficiency for heat engines, refrigerators, and heat pumps. So first I want to go ahead and describe the Carnot cycle. This is an important cycle, as we just talked about, the second law of thermodynamics. And we'll realize it puts an upper bound on the efficiency of all cycles. So first I'm going to look at the Carnot cycle for a gas. And we'll have an ideal gas where we have the relationship Pd equals Rt. The first step of this cycle is we put energy into our working fluid. This is QH, but we keep the temperature constant at TH. And so if I look at this equation over here, if T is a constant, I realize PV have an inverse relationship. As I add this energy, the volume is increasing. So if I were to draw this step on a PV diagram, I would start here. The pressure would have to decrease as the volume increased. And I would go along something like that. So this would be step one of the Carnot cycle. Now, the next step of the cycle is to continue to have this system expand in volume, but now it's insulated so that there's no heat input at all. And so if this is generating some work, but I'm not putting any energy in, I know its internal energy has to go down, so therefore its temperature has to go down. So I'm going to go from a high temperature to a lower temperature at a larger volume. And this would be step two of the Carnot cycle. Now I'm going to go ahead and start to reverse the system. So now I'm going to go ahead and compress it here. And at this point, I'm going to be rejecting heat, but keeping the temperature constant. Now I'm at a lower temperature now, I'm at TL, volume is decreasing, and so the pressure is going to have to go up somewhat. And so this would be step three as I follow that isotherm there. So that is step three of the Carnot cycle. Now to finish out the cycle, step four, I'm going to go ahead and continue to decrease the volume. This step again is insulated, and so I'm putting work in. If it's insulated, the internal energy has to go up, therefore its temperature is going to go up. And I'm going to go up to my last point here, which is at a higher temperature. So this is step four. So on this PV diagram, there are two isotherms that I'm operating between, TH and TL. So those are my two energy sources, or my energy source and my energy sink. And there's four steps to the cycle. Now, I could do the, the Carnot cycle not with an ideal gas, but perhaps something that's a mixture. So let's go ahead and draw a PV diagram. We're now in the saturation region, and I've got these four steps. So I'll just kind of quickly go through this. Our first step here is we're, we're adding energy, but we want to keep the temperature constant. And so the only way we could do that by adding energy is to be operating within the mixture region, and this would be on an isobar and also an isotherm. So this would be TH, and there would be step one in the mixture region. Now I'm going to go ahead and increase the volume again, but now it's going to be insulated. And so at that point, in order to increase my volume, I'm going to go down to a lower temperature. So there would be step two. Then I'm going to go ahead and decrease the volume in step three. I need to keep the temperature constant, so I'll be following an isotherm there, which will also be at a constant pressure. And then the final step to decrease the volume, keeping the system insulated, returning to my high temperature up here. So this is... T low down here, this was step three, this was step four, and I'm operating here underneath the saturation region. So the, the steps are a little different in the fact that these isothermal steps are also going to be isobaric. There's two Carnot principles, and let me go ahead and, and go through both of them here. The first is that the efficiency of an irreversible heat engine is always less than the efficiency of a reversible one when they're operating between the same two reservoirs. So that just simply says that we're an irreversible system, one that has friction, or one that is operating very fast relative to its fluids, is going to have a lower efficiency. The second principle says the efficiency of all reversible heat engines, if they're operating between the same two reservoirs, are the same. So this is, again, all reversible engines are going to have the same efficiency, it's going to be determined strictly by the temperatures that they're operating between. This diagram does a good job of, of uh, graphically representing those two principles. So these two over here on the left are the first Carnot principle that says this irreversible heat engine has to have a lower efficiency than the reversible one. 
So this irreversible one, you can think this is anything that has some sort of friction in it um, that's causing this irreversibility in it, or it's occurring so fast relative to the molecules of the working fluid that we're not going to have a reversible system. The second one over here, which is just saying, if I have two heat engines, they're both reversible, they've got to have the exact same efficiency, and it's determined simply by the temperatures TH and TF. So I um, want to talk about what's called the thermodynamic temperature scale that we use to classify what are the temperatures that these heat engines are operating in between. And this is an example that's given in your textbook, but I'll go ahead and go through it as well because I think it's important. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give myself a pair of heat engines. So I'll call this heat engine A. Well, actually, let me go ahead and erase that. I'm going to call this heat engine A up here and this heat engine B. And this is going to be accepting energy from a temperature T1, so I'll go ahead and call that Q1. And then there's going to be an intermediate temperature down here I'll call T2 that the second heat engine is going to operate in between. And then it's going to be dumping energy down there. This would be Q3. All the energy that comes off of heat engine 1 is going to go, heat engine A will go into B, and so we'll go ahead and call that Q2. Now, I could also have a single heat engine operating between these two reservoirs over here, and I will go ahead and call that heat engine C. And so that will be accepting Q1, and this will be rejecting Q3. So I have a combined system of two engines or just a single engine here. Now, the first Carnot principle said that the efficiency of all heat engines operating between the temp same temperature scale. So it's a function of simply TH and TL. So I know the efficiency of every engine is going to be a function of simply its two temperatures. So for example, the efficiency of heat engine A is going to be some function of T1 and T2. Well, the other thing I know, we know what the, the efficiencies of heat engines are. They're 1 minus QL over QH. So what I realize is this all also a function of, and I'll just use a different symbol G to represent this function over here, of Q1 and Q2. So the efficiency is a function of temperatures, and it's also a function of its uh, the amount of heat input that I have. Now, I could write the same efficiency for efficiency of B, and heat engine B is going to be a function of T2 and T3. And the efficiency of heat engine C is going to be simply a function of T1 and T3. Now, if I would go ahead and multiply my heat engine A and heat engine B, I would have Q1 over Q2 times Q2 over Q3. And we realize that that is Q1 over Q3. And that's this... Um, Right over here I have for heat engine C, which is Q1 over Q3. So this tells me that the ratios of the heat are somehow functions of the temperature. And so I could go ahead and express my efficiency as simply a ratio of the temperature instead of a ratio of the heat. None of the idea of the thermodynamic temperature scale is I'm going to express my temperatures in absolute so that I don't have zeros in the bottom of my, uh, in the denominator of any of my equations over here. And that's going to go ahead and define the efficiency of a reversible heat engine. These heat engines here had to be reversible in order for the efficiency of, of C to be the same as the efficiency of A and B combined. So this gives you the idea of the Carnot efficiency that says the ratios of the Q's are equal to the ratios of the T's. So now I can go ahead and write the efficiency of the heat engine that is reversible. And reversible is just another word for Carnot is going to be 1 minus TL over TH. Now the efficiency of all heat engines, they don't have to be reversible, it's always 1 minus QL over QH. But if it's a reversible engine, no friction, I can go ahead and use that relationship there. And I can do the same thing with the coefficient of performance. So for example, if we think about the coefficient of performance was for a refrigerator, I had 1 over, and this will be, if it's a, um, a reversible one, I'm going to replace the ratios of Q's with T's. And I have 1 over, I'm um, sorry, oops, erase that there. This will be 1 over TH over TL minus 1. And the coefficient of performance of a heat pump that is reversible 
will be 1 over 1 minus TL over TH. So if it's Carnot, which means that it's reversible, I replace the ratios of Qs with the ratios of temperatures, and I can find out what their efficiencies are. So let's look at a practical example of this. In this example here, it says, how much power is this reversible heat engine delivering? So now I know that this heat engine here is reversible. So I can go ahead and find out its efficiency. And its efficiency is the 1 minus T low over T high. And I'm given the temperature. Now, one of the important things is I never want to have a zero in my denominator. So I want to use absolute temperature in these relationships. This is going to be 1 minus T low is going to be 373 Kelvin over 1273 Kelvin. They go ahead and get the efficiency of this heat engine. And that is 0 0.707. So now if I want to know how much power it's delivering, well, we know that the work that's being delivered is going to be its efficiency times QH. So I put in my efficiency of 0 0.707. Here's QH it's delivering 500 kilowatts of energy. And that's going to tell me how much work it produces, which is 353 kilowatts. And since this is reversible, this is the most energy that any heat engine could deliver operating between those two temperatures. Now, one of the things that we've realized is that energy has quality. And the reason we can think about that is, imagine I have some system and it's at, say, 100 degrees Celsius. And if I was to go ahead and put say, one kilojoule of energy in there, this might raise to, say, 101 degrees Celsius. And we know that the higher the temperature, the higher efficiency is of, of the heat engine that I operate in between this. So I, this might be, end up being my high temperature source. And if it was at 101, I would have a higher efficiency. We call the efficiency is 1 minus TL over TH. So the greater TH is, the greater the efficiency is going to be. Now, the next kilojoule that I put in here, maybe that's going to raise this up to 102 degrees Celsius. And I realize that that kilojoule of energy even has a higher quality because the amount of energy I put in, now this is operating at 102 instead of 101, although I only put one kilojoule of energy in each time. So each kilojoule of energy I put in increases in quality if it's at a higher temperature. So it looks like as I add energy here, I'm actually increasing the quality of my energy. However, in order to get one kilojoule of energy into this 100, when it's at 100, it might have to be at, say, 101 degrees Celsius, and it would have gotten colder. And so I moved energy from 101 to 100, I actually lost quality. So um, as we realize what's going on here is that the energy quality is continually rolling downhill.